We're out in the Thames Estuary off the coast of Essex and Kent in the United Kingdom. We are visiting a set of anti-aircraft forts called Red Sands which were put in place in 1942 and designed by Guy Monsell. They were very, very strategic in the saving of London from the Luftwaffe bombers during World War II. Great Britain, the key targets for the German Air Force were airfields, plants, docks, major railway junctions and ports. Many cities were suffering from massive air raids and London was no exception. A vulnerable part of the British capital's air defence was the wide Thames estuary. It was like an avenue for Luftwaffe warplanes to approach their targets so the Admiralty decided to cover this breach with a system of forts. They had all sorts of ideas that they thought of, but, but they couldn't really come to any, any, any conclusion. They looked around for people who may be able to build something or design something, and they, they, they come across uh, Guy Monsell, who was a sort of leading architectural engineer at the time. And he, he came up with some ideas that he put to the Admiralty, and some of them were thrown out, and some of them were thought about for a while, but they had to act fairly quickly. It was 1942, the war was becoming more and more intense and the UK couldn't leave London unprotected from German aviation. The government approved one of Guy Monsell's projects, which had already been used when building a system of forts near Liverpool. Though this project wasn't a standard one, it was quite simple and could be built quickly. Red Sands was part of a system of three forts located on sandbars in the Thames estuary, about 60 kilometers away from London. In August 1942, they started building towers for the future Red Sands artillery battery. Each fort comprised a number of three-storey platforms, supported by hollow reinforced concrete tubes, a little over 20 metres long. This structure was loaded on a special pontoon and towed to the installation site by sea tugs. Then the tower was put onto the seabed. The towers were to be installed in a special order. The platform, with two 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft guns, was put onto the sea first, so that it could defend other towers during their installation. Then they installed the central command tower. It was surrounded by four artillery towers with 94mm Mark VI anti-aircraft guns. The seventh platform was put further out and equipped with a powerful searchlight. The towers were interconnected by steel walkways. All the platforms were designed in such a way so that together they formed an integral system. The fort's anti-aircraft guns could fire at 360 degrees. A submerged telephone cable and a radio link provided its coastal communications. The idea of the construction as you see them now, where they're placed, is in the same sort of format and formation as it would be on land in an ordinary uh, artillery base that you'd have on land. So it's protected by the Bofors Tower and the Searchlight Tower are arranged in such a way that they, they uh, protect each other in a way. In November 1943, the Red Sands Fort was completed and put on full alert. Here we are on gun tower number one. Here's the shell locker to my left. 32 shells held in this locker. There are three others around the site as well. For this gun, the 3.7 inch gun. Also on the other towers as well, another three towers having the same gun, same shell lockers. Also, the Beaufort tower, which held two of its own Beaufort guns. This indeed was a very good installation and very effective in World War II.
Command and control over the fort was exercised from the central command tower. This is where the fort kept its most precious tool, the radar. Propelling these forts out at sea uh, with the radar um, extended the ability to see what activities the, the Germans were doing. They were, they were putting mines in the, in the outskirts of the estuary and when the merchant ships, ships left uh, London and on their way out, they, they would have been detonated and they would have damaged the ships. But with the radar, you could see where they were and you could then control your merchant ships around the mines so that they, uh, they didn't uh, get, get attacked. So it's a it good extension of, of having the radar out here than, rather than back in London or the, on the Kent and Essex coast because it would have been too short a distance for it to work. And it worked very well. You can only guess how the soldiers felt when they arrived at Red Sands. They were to spend a month in iron boxes elevated over water in the middle of the sea, and the crews had to keep their spirits up, as they were on the front line of the British capital's air defence. And uh, I have uh, spoken to somebody who worked on here at that time, and he, he was saying that it was quite a hard job at times, and it was uh, very, very mentally demanding because you had to uh, keep, keep busy to stop yourself going a bit, a bit crazy, really. During the war, there was um, a lot of time when they were outside, certainly in the winter months. From my understanding is they used to have to keep leaving the top and going inside for a little bit and come back out again because it was just too hot, too cold. But um, there's no heating upstairs that would keep the, the roof warm. Um, so they just had to brave it out, a bit like, I suppose, any other soldier out in, in, the, you know, in the field, really. But they still had to do lots of duties that were set for them on, on, on the fort. Uh, they would be things like uh, drill service where they would clean the searchlight tower, they'd maintain the guns, they would maintain the building itself and generally they would look out for enemy aircraft, they would uh, load up the shells onto the, the roof area and put them into the lockers there and they would um, pretty much uh, keep on uh, testing their ability to respond fairly quickly in, in the event of an air raid. During the war, the air defence forts shot down 22 aircraft, 35 V-1 flying bombs, and even seriously damaged a German submarine that entered the Thames estuary to deploy mines. In general, the Monsal forts proved to be very effective. The enemy no longer dared to fly to London from the sea. Previously conducting a raid on the British capital from around the corner was a walk in the park for the Luftwaffe. And now, Monsell's towers made this route extremely dangerous. When the uh, cease of hostilities finished, with the war finishing in 45, uh, a caretaker crew were left on board uh, all the forts to just to maintain and look after it in case anything started up again and, and uh, a lot of the time they were just just playing cards and things like that just busying themselves and not having too much to do but trying to keep it in in good condition and then finally in sort of 1956 they decided to they didn't require them anymore the government decided they didn't need them anymore so they decided to just get people off and that's it they abandoned them completely by 1958. During the next six years, the forts were looted completely. Everything that could be cut off or taken away is gone forever.
Meanwhile, the 60s were in full swing. People wanted to have fun. New music was becoming popular among the youth. And the only official radio station at the time, BBC, broadcasted it for only an hour a week. This formed fertile soil for the emergence of pirate radio stations in the United Kingdom. Um, some entrepreneurs then thought, well, perhaps rather than have a ship, we'll use these forts, because they were in international waters at the time. And uh, come, come 1967, the government were really desperate to, to get, get rid of them. They thought, well, if we can get rid of the boats, we'll just change the law uh, where you can't supply the boats, you can't supply them with food, and, uh, and you can't supply them with advertising. But they were having trouble with the forts because they were in international waters and they were in the Thames Estuary. They, they did some crafty things, really. They, um, they decided that they would subtly get lots of sand from outside the Thames estuary and drop it very close to middle sand, which is a sandbank, and just drop lots and lots of sand on it until very discreetly, so no one saw. And then suddenly they got these admiral of the, uh, the, the Admiralty come out with a flag, a, a UK flag, and stick it on the sandbank and say, it's now above water, this is the water datum line for the UK and you're two miles away and not three miles away uh, and so they just changed the law of, of the sea and they finally decided that they can now prosecute them under the Wireless Telegraphy Act of the UK that they will have to cease broadcasting. There was lots of appeals and they kept on appealing and appealing and uh, finally uh, that was it, they had to close down. When the radio stations were shut down, Guy Monsell's forts were abandoned for good, and since then, they've been in a state of disrepair, falling apart right in front of your eyes. A week before our film crew arrived at the fort, a part was torn away from one of the platforms and fell into the water, bringing the Monsell Towers one step closer to complete destruction. Time is now the key enemy for these really wonderful structures and it looks like they are destined to lose this battle.